Hey, it's Marcel. Before we kick off this episode, I want to tell you about a new resource for my listeners. I'm kicking off a brand new way for you to engage me personally. I've joined Substack. If you're not familiar with Substack, it's an online platform that allows content creators like me to publish blogs and text-based posts straight to your phone, podcasts, discussion threads, audio clips, and videos. It's really a way to build community and provide you, my listener, with a one central place where you can get everything I have to offer. You'll find a lot of coaching tips and advice there, all by leadership tips of the week and month, and exclusive content not available anywhere. So the point is to bring you as much value as possible. And hey, you can still listen to the Love in Action podcast over at Substack. So this is about building community, and you'll be able to engage me and other people by commenting, by asking me questions directly, and sharing in the conversation. So head on over to my Substack platform. I'm going to leave you with a link for you to click on in the show notes. Check it out, and I'll see you over there. Welcome to the Love in Action podcast, the show that explores all the ways you can evolve into the best version of yourself as a leader. I'm your host, executive coach, speaker, and author, Marcel Schwantes. I believe that when we show up with our full humanity to work and lead from a place of love and care and inclusion, it will make a radical difference in your leadership, your business, and your bottom line. This is a show about love as a leadership and business strategy. Let's do this. Hey, welcome to the Love in Action podcast. We're going to talk about a topic today that many of you are familiar with if you're a longtime listener. It's a topic that I believe is is the glue that holds humanity and relationships together. And I'm talking about trust. So trust is also a pretty fragile thing when you think about it, right? Because if trust is broken, it can be really hard to, you know, to repair it, to, to kind of get back to how things were and reconcile the relationship. So when our own trustworthiness is questioned or our confidence in others is shaken, as is, as is increasingly been the case in this, this polarized society that we are now in over the last, you know, five, six, maybe 10 years, it can be really hard to restore it. But the good news is that it's possible. It is possible. So today we're going to talk about how to build build trust, right? The, the process of building trust, but also how to restore it when that trust is broken or violated. And if so, how do we do it? So to do that, We're going to be talking to an expert, Dr. Peter H. Kim, who has spent two decades building a a body of scientific knowledge around this very topic of trust. And, you know, this has been a field that until Peter kind of started investigating it, it's it's been largely undeveloped when you think about it. So Dr. Kim wrote a book called How Trust Works, The Science of How Relationships Are Built, Broken, and Repaired. It was released about a year ago. And that book addresses the topic of building and restoring trust based on his rigorous research. So who is Dr. Peter Kim? Well, he's a professor of management and organization at the Marshall School of Business at the University of Southern California, one of my favorite schools as when we talk about sports programs, that's one of my favorites. Their football football program is his, has been historically one of the best ever. I know I'm biased because I am a SoCal guy who grew up in Los Angeles. So his research has been published in numerous academic journals. You're going to find that he has received um, numerous awards nationally and internationally. And Dr. Kim has been featured by the New York Times, Washington Post, and National Public Radio, among many, many other outlets. And Dr. Kim now joins us. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Marcel. It's a pleasure being here with you. Your research is going to be informing our conversation without a doubt. So I wanted to start with this. Are we 
trusting less these days, especially as Americans? The simple answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Every survey that I have seen has indicated that trust uh, in not only in one another, but in leaders, in 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 uh, businesses, in government, in politics, uh, even in education <laughs> has gone down. Right. Uh, and so uh, this has been a, a broad theme, and it's not only in the U.S. It's uh, around the world. Uh, so uh, mm. you you name the survey, <laughs> uh, there is an indication that trust has been on the decline. So I I get the political part. Without a doubt, because um, this is my assumption, okay? And tell me if your research backs this up. I see that media narrative has has played a role in influencing perception. And so whether your call whatever your political affiliation is, if you're liberal or a Democrat or a conservative uh, Republican from that from from those those wings, uh, you're going to be attracted by whatever ha whatever information I is presenting the, your worldview, right? So it's it's biased, uh, and so you're going to be drawn to that because that's the narrative that that you're you know that that's that's what's drawing people is 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 drawing people to these political narratives, and a lot of it may not even be true. It's just how the media seems to have figured out a way to divide us by uh, presenting information that really uh, appeals to their political corner. So I don't know if that has any validity from the research standpoint, but I clearly see it um, because there are people that I have lost friends, friendships over due to how what their world political worldview is, which is now coloring other parts of their lives. And because of that, we have stopped talking to the point where we can't even come to the table anymore. I mean, I have tried to actually encourage people to come to the table to talk about our differences, just so I can understand where they're coming from. I know where they're coming from, but at least I want to. I want to be able to show show some some I don't know some humanity, some connection points, and just to 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 see if there's more commonalities around our differences. If that makes sense, meaning that we're still humans and we still are um care about lots of the same issues right but because of the polarization that i have seen over the last few years we have even lost the capacity to 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 empathize with the other person to to say okay i'm willing to sit down and listen i may not may not agree with you but i can i can understand where you're coming from we've lost that so what is what what's what's your what's your take on that? There's a lot to unpack there. So <laughs> I, I think you're you're uh on to something very important. Uh first, uh from the research standpoint, uh, mm -hmm. one of the key themes of the work that I've done is that the stories we tell are are as if not more important than what happened. <laughs> so the, the narratives we construct about why something happened, uh, the attributions we make uh, about, you know, uh, people who are involved in those situations uh, can play such a huge role that, you know, uh, you know, we, we focus on uh, whether or not someone's guilty or not, whether something did uh, this thing that they're accused of or not. But the reasons why this might have happened are essential for us to, to understand how to relate to the situation, how to respond to the situation and the person that was involved. Um, and with regard to your point about how we are all human and wanting to find that, that common, uh, uh, common humanity that, mm -hmm. that, that can unite us, that gets to the fact that we are, uh, you know, one of the most important determinants of trust is our perception that others have integrity. Uh, but what does integrity mean, right? So, and this is where we have to unpack this 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 simple idea uh, and, and into something that 
has a lot more nuance. And, and so on, on the one on one level, the simplest understanding of integrity is do other people adhere to principles you find acceptable? And it turns out that if you uh, survey people around the world, there are some core foundations uh, that we consider vital for, uh, for integrity. These foundations are things that, uh, you know, in different societies, uh, you know, people will say are important. But what's critical here is that the way we prioritize the different foundations of integrity can differ. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the political divide in the U.S., for example, uh, we may all believe in these certain elements uh, of uh, uh, that, that that determine whether or not is some you know this is a good act or a bad act uh but in the real world uh what what happens is that things get pretty complex there are trade-offs that are that often have to be made when you make a particular choice and that involves oftentimes a trade-off between these different moral principles and so if you're making these trade-offs and different people make these trade-offs differently, we can easily fall into the trap of saying, okay, this person didn't make the choice I would have made, so their integrity must be low. Mm. Uh, when in fact, they may believe that they are doing the right thing based on their how they have prioritized these moral principles. Uh, and they may feel unfairly maligned, so they're defensive, and they may s see your choices as a an indication that you lack integrity. We're doing so the ex side, right. We're doing the exact same thing to the other side, basically, like trying to justify our integrity while while uh, you know castigating theirs because they don't agree with my point of view, whereas they think that uh, their integrity is is completely justified and. <laughs> And whereas mine, it's not. So it's 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 going on both sides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that finger pointing is is something that is, in many ways, very difficult to overcome. Because as soon as you believe someone has low integrity, uh, our our gut reaction is to say they should not be trusted. We don't want anything to do with them. So we don't put in the effort to try to overcome that. And so. Uh, when you invite people to your table <laughs> to have this broader conversation, that is a very difficult thing to do unless people come to the uh, realization that this doesn't necessarily mean this difference doesn't necessarily mean that the other's integrity is low. We are just making these difficult trade offs differently. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it's only from that position that we can start really having a conversation about, okay. Do you recognize that uh, even though you wouldn't make the same choice, that you are compromising something that could be very important and, right. and, and the same for yourself? And so that becomes more of a negotiation uh, wh where you're really trying to figure out well, how best do you make these trade-offs? Uh, and, and that's not an easy thing to do. It often yeah. gets into the weeds. <laughs> right, it's much right. simpler to say you're bad, I'm good, uh, and that's something that is perpetuated by the media. All right, so let's put a bookmark here because we're delving into the repair side of trust. Let's pull back and talk about how does trust actually work. Well, one of the the baseline assumptions uh, mm -hmm. that was uh, around when I started doing this work was that trust starts at zero and only builds gradually over time as we get to know one another. And, and that was the foundation for a lot of uh, academic work in addition to, you know, what, what's probably still in the popular consciousness of, you know, how, how, how this process operates. Uh, it turns out that that's not the case. Uh, the, the evidence indicates that we actually start with uh, a very high inclination to trust. Uh, trust initial trust tends to be high uh, based on all sorts of cues that we might have about one another. Uh, whether we went to the same school, 
whether we're both from Southern California <laughs> or whether we're, uh, you know, um, you know, have the same political affiliation or, or what have you, credentials and, and, and so on. There, there are all sorts of cues that are out there that can nurture this high initial trust. Uh, the laws and rules in society can also nurture that high initial trust. Uh, but that initial trust, uh, as you noted in the intro, it tends to be very fragile. Uh, mm -hmm. And and so that that can easily be violated. And then the question becomes, how do you navigate this, this transition from this high initial trust to these initial disappointments and, 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 and ultimately get to a stage where you have a, a more robust relationship? One of the things uh, that is clear from the uh, from the evidence is that people are better off when they trust. Uh, and one of the reasons is that you create a self-fulfilling prophecy. And so when you trust others, they don't try to exploit you like the like much of the research uh, before I, I dived into this topic uh, had assumed. Uh, the baseline assumption was that, when you trust others, they see this as an opportunity for exploitation. It turns out that that's not the case. Most people, when you trust them, they want to prove you right. <laughs> they they want to show you that, yes, you are correct in trusting me, and they want to live up to that expectation. They mm. see trust as a precious resource to preserve for the future. They understand the value of trust. And so, sure, there are people who might want to exploit that trust. Uh, there, there are plenty of examples like that. But the prevailing tendency is, is to nurture that trust that is given. And so people who are trusting wind up better off in, in all sorts of respects. Uh, they are more uh, des desired as, as partners, uh, uh, you, you know, by both trusting and non-trusting others. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and, and so uh, there are all sorts of benefits there. We, we can also connect this to productivity. So uh, there is a strong correlation between the level of trust in society and uh, gross national product, right? So th there is a clear link there. So more trust makes people better off. With that said, uh, there are certainly times when you should not trust. And, and so the real question is, what are the cues that you should rely on to determine whether or not someone's trustworthy or not? Okay. Um, and beyond this you know, initial presumption of trust, are there things that, that should lead you to decide this person is not trustworthy? Okay, how do we repair these broken systems, you know, where where trust where we think there's no way that we could ever repair this? It's beyond repair. Um, what would you say to to that? I think you're right that this has become a more pervasive problem in organizations. Uh, and it really is uh, something that's re reflecting what's going on in society. Mm. W one of the goals that I had in, in, in the book, uh, it was to help encourage people to look into themselves and to put in more of the effort to understand these situations, uh, to understand how easy it is to make the wrong attribution of one another, mm. how easy it is to point these fingers and, and then to do the work that's required to, to do more of the uh, investigation that's necessary to uh, to really understand the other side's perspective. So exactly what you're doing with your friend, yeah, reaching out to try to understand. Uh, we're not doing enough of that uh, in organizations. We are simply dictating what should be done to one another. Uh, and what what we have, what this is a reflection of, is a narrative based, uh, a dynamic based on domination imposing our our priorities on other people rather than dialogue. Mm -hmm. And when when this is the dynamic, 
this will always be short-lived. So the domination will occur and persist until a new regime <laughs> takes hold. <laughs> and, and the other side will, will do their best to gain the power to change the status quo. Right. Uh, so it, it, it's always going to be this 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 situation where each, you know the, the 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 ones with the upper hand will try to impose their worldview, and I think that's a very short sighted approach. Yeah. Uh, what we need more of is this dialogue, the kind of dialogue you're trying to nurture with your friend, and and that may not ever occur. Your friend may not be willing. This gets to the fact that the rebuilding of trust requires both sides to come to the table. Uh, and that isn't always the case. What international relations scholars do discuss though, is that there are times when that does occur, uh, when the situation becomes untenable enough where both sides realize they're not just gonna get their way and, and, and not suffer any costs. When th this is something that does require an agreement from both sides. And to the extent that, you know, uh, that happens, that that dialogue happens, then we can really unpack what's going on here. Why would they have this view? Is it because they are prioritizing certain things uh, that that we may not at the moment, but we would in other situations? Mm. Right? And, and And how can we best achieve this outcome that that essentially we that, that we all share that we all believe in these fundamental uh, principles and it's really about figuring out the best way to nurture those principles overall. Yeah, I, and that's almost another way of saying you have to hop off, um, hop off whatever your your preferred bandwagon is, you know, that's causing you to have a one track mind, right? Whatever narrative you're following, you have to hop off of that uh, to be open and curious and, and considering of other perspectives, I think. So that, that leads me to another question because I'm wondering with trust repair, have you seen, do you have an example of maybe of, violations of trust that are really, really hard to repair, what would that be? What I've found uh, through countless studies mm -hmm. is that as soon as you see a violation as a matter of integrity, as an indication that they lack integrity, then it's almost impossible to, to repair that relationship, no matter what's done. They might apologize, they might assume all blame they might uh offer substantive responses like you know p pay huge penalties and so on it won't be enough because the way we see one another tends to uh be distorted uh, we weigh different kinds of information differently so if you see someone as confirming a lack of integrity that no matter how many instances of positive integrity they exhibit afterwards, we're going to dismiss those positive signals because mm. we believe that they're just biding their time before they screw us again. So the the real challenge is to see this incident uh, and all the complexity it might entail and, and recognize that maybe it isn't such a clear cut uh, demonstration of low integrity. Uh, to what extent are there other considerations that might help us uh, explain uh, the situation? Maybe they only the, the, they were compelled to by the situation, uh, whatever that might be. Uh, they they were compelled to by their boss, or maybe they didn't know what would happen as a result of this choice. They weren't fully aware. Yeah. Uh, so that that lack of understanding, that lack of knowledge, that lack of ability. Uh, when, when we see that same incident from the lens, uh, then we're much more willing to give that person another chance because we believe that people with low competence can become more competent over time. They, they can learn, uh, they can get better. And so subsequent de demonstrations of competence tend to be weighed much more heavily than evidence of incompetence. So someone may screw up um, 
uh, let's say your accountant screws up your your tax return, <laughs> but right. then never does that again, does it perfectly from there then on. Well, that kind of experience is one in which we are more likely to believe that the person has corrected that failing, whatever oversight that occurred initially, and that they could be relied upon in the future. I'm wondering if a lot of what you have taught us so far has to do with breaking out of group norms and uh, or maybe group beliefs that are not serving humanity in a positive way. Here's my example, okay, because you had it in your book. I hate to bring this up, but um, the horrific Charlottesville event of 2017, where you know th three people died at that uh, what was it called the unite the right unite the uh, unite the right rally. So you had nationalist white nationalist groups there, and I mean, and and you know, of course, when that happens, trouble ensues. But what I found really interesting is what you wrote, uh, and I'm going to quote you. You mentioned that it's far easier to build trust within groups than to build trust between groups. And, and I'm thinking about all of the bridge building that needs to develop between groups that are not of, you know, our own beliefs and experiences and values. That caused me to raise the mirror to because I I had to, you know, look at myself in the mirror after that to to wonder if I am I doing enough to break or to build trust between groups that I may not normally affiliate with. I'm curious what your take is on this. Like um, a lot of what we're, we've been talking about is kind of trying to build bridges with people outside of our own understanding and 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 beliefs. Uh, and values, right? So you're touching on an important dynamic that occurs uh, in a group context. Uh, so yeah. all the things we've been talking about at the individual level, at the interpersonal level, gets magnified at the group level because we tend to see uh, our own groups with rose-colored glasses and people outside our groups as threats as less deserving as as problems uh, that uh, we need to ward against. Uh, and that dynamic helps exacerbate some of the problems uh, that that can occur with regard to the narratives that we tell because it it is natural to infer that members of out groups um, lack integrity, uh, they have nefarious motives uh, and so on and to believe that members of your own group, have uh, benevolent motives, that they are more deserving, and, and so on. This this is just a, a fundamental aspect of how we perceive the world. The, 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 so as soon as we create group demarcations, regardless of the basis of that demarcation, uh, we will have that dynamic. Uh, we also see members of outgroups as, uh, as kind of homogenous. Uh, we, we don't differentiate members of outgroups, whereas we are more likely to do that within our own groups. So when things happen, let's say someone from an outgroup uh, does something bad, we see it as a reflection of the entire group. Mm. Whereas if that same incident happened by someone within our own groups, we just see that one person as a bad apple and not reflective of our own groups. And so the way we sort of make attributions uh, about that same incident by that, you know, by one individual can be dramatically different. And for that reason, we also believe that the remedies should differ. So if it's an act by someone in the outgroup, if they've done something wrong, we believe that the entire outgroup should be punished. Whereas if we believe Whereas if that same incident occurred within our own group, well, we see this as something that was due to a bad apple, that only that individual should be punished. And it would be unfair if the rest of us should be punished as well, because we had nothing to do with it. Right. So so that gets to, you know, a whole set of additional challenges that arises, not only with how we interpret these transgressions, but also 
uh, with regard to what we think an appropriate remedy would be for mm. resolving it. All right. So we get to the point where we talk about what appropriate remedies would be in, in the case of trust repair. So speak to the CEO, because we got a lot of listeners that are in high level places, right? So speak to the leader, the CEO. How do I begin this journey of uh, navigating trust better so that what well, whether it's to the point where, where we avoid getting to have to repair it. But if we arrive there, how do we do it? How do we repair it more effectively? CEOs have yet another challenge uh, mm -hmm. that's particular to them <laughs> or the particular to people who are in positions of power. So uh, similar to this issue of how we perceive people in out groups uh, uh, versus in groups, we see those in positions of power differently. Uh, we believe, for example, that CEOs, if they are involved in a transgression, that it was more intentional because we believe that those in positions of power can do what they want. And so mm -hmm. if and for that reason, any transgression we will see as uh, we are far more likely to see as a matter of integrity if right. it's committed by a high power person. The additional challenge that CEOs face is that. If they try to use uh, what, what typically works in these situations, or, or what is far more likely to work, uh, an expression of remorse and and and, and attempt to uh, you know sort of address the incident as an indication that you are going to try to fix this incident, we are more likely to believe that those expressions of remorse are fake. Uh, because we believe that people in positions of power are better able to manage their emotions and do so strategically. <laughs> so, so that's the additional challenge that CEOs face. <laughs> uh, but the one flip side uh, of, of this is that uh, because CEOs often have these positions of power because they are bringing more to the table, uh, Others around them will have more at stake at preserving the relationship. They will have more motivation to preserve the relationship so long as that CEO is bringing something to the table that's of value. So uh, to the extent that people see that and realize that, that could be beneficial um, because that motivation to preserve the relationship can be very important. The other thing that we would I would point out to CEOs is that this also underscores the need to cultivate those relationships, right? So you cannot be uh, a CEO that that just uh, rules by fiat and 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 just uh, you know uh, doesn't care about the relationships with the workers. The more that they believe that they have a relationship with you, the more they will care about preserving that relationship. So uh, that is an important. Uh, consideration. And let me leave you with a third consideration. And it's that, you know, a lot of, as, as we've talked about uh, so far, a lot of what affects people's reactions to uh, something going wrong is the story that we tell. And mm. oftentimes we leave that story up to the perceiver. Uh, they are making that choice. But you as a CEO or any individual can shift that narrative. You can try to affect that narrative. And one way of doing so is by doing everything possible to rule out the possibility that you lack integrity, right? To, to uh, make it clear that you care about doing the right thing, that you care about doing right by the workers and so on, so that if something goes wrong, they're less likely to automatically shift to the idea that you're just trying to exploit the situation for personal gain. Right. That's so good. Uh, I'm glad that I'm glad that we're sort of winding down on that note because uh, I was looking so for like what's the what's the what's the positive uh, way to to bring us home here. Um, and before we do that, though, is there anything that we didn't cover that you think right now it's like oh I. I I I wish I had told Marcel this. So what would that be, if anything, that we have to we have to know before we get off? One thing I would leave uh, you with is the idea 
that if we start with a premise that people are good, mm -hmm. that people generally want to prove others right when they're trusted, th then this leads to a very different way of thinking about how to run an organization. So, so many organizations are dominated by HR departments that are overwhelmed by rules that are trying to get people to, to keep people from doing the wrong thing, instilling all these bureaucratic, uh, bureaucratic policies and so on that, 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 that try to prevent those bad outcomes. Another way of thinking about how to run an organization is to nurture this the, the fact that people are generally good and to create the infrastructure to help nurture that. And so um, one example that I would convey uh, is the difference between this typical HR dominated bureaucratic approach and a company like Netflix, for example, who uh, has a very simple policy for HR, which is uh, work in Netflix's best interests. Mm. That's it. It's a simple policy <laughs> based on the idea that most people w do want to do the right thing. And they have found that this has been an extraordinarily helpful way of reducing bureaucracy, enabling freedom and creativity and productivity at the organization. That's a, 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 an approach based on seeing the good in people, believing that people are trustworthy and creating the infrastructure to allow that to flourish. I love that. That is, and I think, I mean, so many of the best places to work that, uh, that I have tracked over the years, uh, you know, uh, maybe even Google in, in their earlier years, I don't know if if that's the case uh, these days, but, uh, you know, they preached uh, autonomy and freedom and ownership and decentralization, right? To be able to hire very bright people and allow them to exercise their brains to do the job. But not only that, to, to make decisions on their own because they're giving them license to, up to, to say, we trust you. That's why we hired you. We believe that you have the skills and the aptitude and the integrity to act on making good choices. And, uh, oh, man, and that's right up my alley as far as like, you know, uh, the, the work that you and I do. Uh, I think this is where we overlap is because I'm teaching uh, leaders more and more about that, about, uh, you know, taking your hands off the wheel and giving people competency, clarity, and then back away and let them go. And good things will happen. Um especially on the, you know, on the employee experience front, right? They're going to have a much more positive experience at work when they are allowed that that much freedom. Yeah, I agree 100%. Mm. Absolutely. All right, we bring it home with two questions as we do with every guest. So we have this uh, traditional love question, right? So it goes like this. If I'm a higher, a higher level leader and I want to adopt a more human leadership approach, um, maybe even bring more trust into the organization. How do I lead with more practical love and care day in and day out? So my response to that question would focus on uh, what love means. Uh, and, and, and to really love someone, you have to really understand and know someone. Uh, it, love is not based on a superficial impression. It is based on uh, real understanding, real knowledge, uh, and, and embracing uh, what you've learned. Uh, and, and so uh, that connects with the, the message of my own book, which is you need to investigate these situations more carefully. Uh, the more you take the time to really understand people, why something might have happened, uh, the, the better off you're going to be in terms of your chances of preserving and, and nurturing that relationship. Uh, and, and the more they are likely to do that with you. Uh, and, and so everyone benefits through that more compassionate, informed approach to uh, understanding one another. Ah, love it. Love it. All right, Peter, close us out. What's what's that final takeaway we can take home? One of the things I would stress is that we, we assume that when things go wrong, it is the other side's responsibility mm. to address the incident. Uh, it's a very passive approach 
to these situations and one that can leave us very frustrated because they typically won't do what we want. Uh, What I would stress is that we as perceivers, those who are on the other side of the equation, have quite a bit of this responsibility as well. We have a responsibility to uh, investigate what happens. We have the responsibility to uh, initiate that dialogue, uh, to create situations that would allow trust to flourish rather than just simply assume that it's either not there or there. Uh, we, we can actually create an infrastructure to make that possible. Uh, and we have a duty to respond to these incidents in a way that will actually nurture the kinds of responses we want most. Because most, uh, quite a bit of, uh, of the time, our responses will discourage the kinds of apologies, the kinds of reparative attempts that we so desperately want. Uh, yeah, that's a great way to end. Peter, it's been such an honor to talk to you. If if people wanted to connect with you and uh, you know find out more about you, where can they go? Well, uh, I'm on LinkedIn, so you can certainly do a search uh, for me there. And I have a website, peterhkim.com, uh, if you are interested in learning more about the book and, and other things about me. And the book, again, is called How Trust Works. There it is for those of you watching on YouTube. And that is Dr. Peter H. Kim. And uh, gosh, this has been fun and uh, enlightening and uh, educational. Thank you so much for being here today. We're better for it. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for this lovely conversation. So you can keep the conversation going on social media with hashtag Love in Action podcast and look for my show notes as well as a YouTube link to watch the show on my website. You can find all that on MarcelSchwantis.com. And finally, hey, if you're interested in sponsoring an episode of the show, let's chat. You can reach me on LinkedIn or find me on my website. Thank you for listening to the Love in Action podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, please share it, subscribe, and leave us a review. Until next time, don't forget, the future of leadership is love in action. Believe it, practice it, and watch your leadership and business flourish.